So hello everybody, I am Robert Stober, I'm a Director of Systems Engineering at Bright Computing. So today I'm going to talk to you about advanced cluster management um, using Bright Cluster Manager. And uh, specifically I'm going to talk about introducing uh, dyna dynam dynamic data center. There you go, since I can't say the other word today. Uh, so let's just go ahead and get started. So we're going to talk about um, uh, cluster management uh, in terms of high, high performance computing, in terms of uh, bursting into the public cloud in terms of uh, big data, in terms of OpenStack, in terms of what we call the bare metal private cloud. So uh, a lot of good stuff and uh, we only have a, a little while to put it all together but um, the idea here is to give you an overview of everything that Bright Cluster Manager can do to transform your data center into a dynamic data center that's able to change and adjust dynamically and automatically to changes in workload. Right, so this is something that we're seeing in industry all the time. More and more we're seeing industry uh, wanting to uh, be able to have flexibility with regard to how their computing resources are used. So that's what this presentation is all about. And actually, this presentation comes from actual industry experience that I've uh, uh, encountered over the last uh, year or so, right? So uh, our mission statement at Bright is that Bright makes it really easy to deploy high-performance computing clusters OpenStack clusters and Hadoop clusters, and we make it easy to manage them over their entire life cycle. So this is the basic value proposition of Bright. This is what we bring to the table. Um, we make it so that you can administer your cluster and manage it using less people, saving money, and increasing efficiency of the organization. So we start off with this uh, very simple representation, this block diagram sort of an, of a, of an HPC cluster. So. Uh, the first thing I mentioned is that Bright makes it really easy to deploy high-performance computing clusters on bare metal quickly and easily. Uh, so Bright also comes with everything that you need in order to uh, use an HPC cluster. So uh, there's a lot of other services that have to be um, uh, installed and configured and ready to go when the cluster is installed. Uh, this slide really calls out workload management. So Bright has integrations with all the popular workload managers, including all those that you see here, PBS Pro, Torque, Torque with Moab, Torque with Maui, LSF, Open Lava, uh, Slurm, Unova Grid Engine, Open Grid Scheduler, which used to be called Sun Grid Engine. So out of the box, Bright installs all these workload managers. We configure them with the de default configuration so that as soon as the cluster is installed, they're ready to use. As soon as you create a user account or integrate with an existing authentication provider such as NIST or LDAP, Active Directory, users can start using the cluster right away. And of course, there's a whole bunch of other services that Bright sets up automatically as well, such as LDAP, such as DNS, TFTP, DHCP, uh, and many others, right? So the whole idea is that it's a turnkey solution. Once you install it, it's ready to go. Uh, and of course, as soon as the cluster is installed, Bright is already collecting metrics. So we collect metrics from every single device in the cluster, including switches, power distribution units, compute nodes, head nodes, workload managers, OpenStack, Docker, Kubernetes, Hadoop, and so on, and GPUs, NVIDIA GPUs. So well, whatever device you have, you can bet that right out of the box, Bright is already uh, collecting metrics from it and running health checks to ensure that it's you know, working properly so that when your users use the cluster, then you can expect to have a, a good experience, which I think is what we all want. Um, and Bright makes all this available to you as the administrator through a single pane of glass. Uh, so through our CM GUI or our CM Shell interface, we have a graphical user interface called CM GUI. We have a shell interface called CM Shell. And through these interfaces, you have the ability to completely manage the cluster. So you can use these tools to do anything you can do on the cluster, including add Hadoop instances, add OpenStack instances, you know, control uh, the workload management system, add users, change IP numbers, whatever it is you want to do, you can do it through one interface and you can even manage multiple clusters at the same time. So Bright has always been known as a very scalable workload manager, um, excuse me, cluster manager, pardon me. In fact, we have clusters um, today that have 5,000 nodes in a single cluster, right? And we've tested up to 10,000 nodes. Uh, so that's something that, that, that we're known for and it's also something that we're constantly working on. Our goal is to get to exascale by 2020. So that's a tall order, but we're busy working on it every day. Um, but Bright also provides the ability to burst into uh, other resource providers, such as Amazon uh, Web Services, AWS, right? So EC2. Um, so for sites that have very bursty workloads, and that's what this 
this, this presentation is really geared towards is sites with varying types of workload or varying workload period, right? So given your HBC cluster that we already talked about that's up and running, right? Uh, immediately out of the box, you can add uh, an AWS account, for example, and then you can burst into Amazon EC2, or you can just create nodes in Amazon EC2. I'm going to talk about both those two scenarios. Uh, so in this scenario here, let's say that you have an Amazon EC2 account, and of course there's nothing running up there yet. Uh, but what you can do is, is you can use two different modes to interface with Amazon. First, you can use the, the, uh, the, the uh, what we call um, the standard model, which is where you manually start up nodes that are in Amazon EC2, and then they, they, they start running, and they continue running forever until you turn them off, right? So what you're doing is you're extending your cluster into EC2. Now, the nodes that are running in, in, inside EC2 are using the same software images that you're using locally, of course, you can have modified versions that are running in EC2, but you can use the exact same software images you're using locally. You don't have to create an AMI or any of that stuff. The same users that are recognized on your cluster locally are also recognized in EC2. The same workload manager that's distributing workload across your cluster locally is doing the same thing in EC2. So as soon as you turn on these nodes in EC2, which you do right through the CM GUI, you create them, turn them on, bam, they come on. They're running the workload manager. So when somebody comes along now and they submit jobs to a queue that has these nodes attached to it, what happens is the workload manager, when these nodes come up, the workload manager comes up, it connects to the workload manager locally. It says, I'm ready, I'll take a job. The workload manager sends the job up to the nodes in Amazon EC2. And this works with all the workload managers that I mentioned a little while ago without modification. So the jobs start running up there. When they're done running, they go away, but the nodes don't. They stay running in this mode, in this manual mode, right? The nodes stay running because you started them manually, they'll continue running forever until you turn them off. But then you turn them off, bam, they go away. Now you're no longer being charged. So you only pay for what you're using, right? So this is one good model that, that a lot of people like to use. Now the next model is even more popular than that, and it's called, um, uh, well, I went a little bit too far there. This is the, um, the um, cluster, uh, help me out, Christian. Cluster extension. <laughs> yeah, cluster extension. Well, they're both cluster extensions, okay? But this is dynamic workload-driven cluster extension, okay? So in this case, there's nothing running up in Amazon EC2. A user comes by, and they submit a job to one of the cloud queues. So what happens is Bright now can be configured to watch one or more cloud queues, and when anybody submits workload to those in accordance with policies that you've got configured, it can automatically and dynamically uh, upload the input files up to Amazon S3, and once those input files have been uploaded, this process could take some time with big input files, right? After the input file is uploaded to Amazon S3, then Bright starts up the instances uh, up in Amazon EC2 in order to run the job, right? Uh, so then the workload manager, of course, the node comes up, the workload manager comes up, the workload manager dispatches the job up to the cloud node, the job runs to completion, goes away, uh, and then uh, Bright will look in the queue, it'll say, are there any more jobs? that need to be run on this cloud node. Since there aren't any, then it'll go ahead and terminate that cloud node. Actually, it shuts it off, excuse me, not terminate. Turns off the cloud node, and then after the cloud node is gone, it downloads the required output files back to the submission directory. So what you have here is an automated system where nothing's running in EC2. Users come and they submit jobs to configured queues, and in accordance with policies that, that, that you've defined, it automatically starts up resources in EC2, runs the jobs, transfers input files, returns data files, turns off the instances, and it all happens automatically, right? So you still only pay for what you actually use, right? And it gives you the ability now to have your cluster, your local physical cluster provisioned to your average workload, but then when a, when a more workload comes in for a certain project, automatically fires up to Amazon EC2, and when it's done, it goes away. So this is a very popular feature. Um, okay. So also, uh, as if that weren't enough, Bright also allows you to uh, deploy big data clusters at the same time. So in your standard Bright cluster that you already have, uh, now you can also deploy Hadoop clusters, right? So um, right through the same CM GUI interface or the CM shell interface, there's a button that says uh, add Hadoop instance. And if you press that button, a dialog box, a wizard comes up. Uh, it asks you a few questions, like what do you want to name your instance, what are your data routes are, what version of Hadoop do you want to use, because Bright supports all the major distributions from, from Apache, from Cloudera, CDH, uh, Hortonworks, HDP, and Pivotal HD. So you can choose any of these distributions, whether they're, whether they're a little bit dated or whether they're brand new, and Bright will automatically deploy those, and you can have multiple instances running. 
In addition to the basic uh, HDFS components, like you see at the bottom there, MapReduce and Yarn and HDFS and Lustre, Bright also allows you to deploy uh, numerous Hadoop ecosystem components, including the ones you see here, but also several more that aren't even shown on my slide because we're constantly adding new ones, right? Um, so these are also deployable. And when a customer comes and says, well, there's a certain tool that we want to use that you don't have, well, we just add it. So that's our solution to that, right? And that's how come we're constantly having new ones added. Bright also allows you to deploy Spark clusters through the same interface. And Spark clusters can be run on top of HDFS or outside of HDFS. So you can have a cluster with multiple HDF instances with different Hadoop versions from different Hadoop vendors, uh, including Spark and, and multiple versions of Spark running on the same infrastructure at the same time, all managed through a single pane of glass. Um, OK. Um, so that's what I'm supposed to say here on this slide. So <laughs> as you can see, the whole infrastructure to us, we see it as a single entity, right? It's your HTTP infrastructure, and we provide the means to man manage it all through a single pane of glass. In the same way as we deploy Hadoop, we can also deploy OpenStack clusters, private clouds, OpenStack private clouds. In fact, Bright is a certified OpenStack distribution, which we're very proud of. Um, so we went to the OpenStack uh, Foundation and got certified, and so... Okay, so uh, what this means is that once you have a bright cluster, you can quickly and easily deploy an OpenStack cluster on top of your, on top of your bright cluster. So uh, there's a button for this, believe it or not, in the CM GUI that opens up a, a wizard, and you can choose to go for the, uh, the, uh, the normal installation, or you can choose express installation. Uh, either way, if you choose the express installation, you can actually deploy an OpenStack instance onto your cluster with as little as five mouse clicks without knowing anything about OpenStack. So this is an amazing product, actually. You all should take a look at it, uh, I think, anyway. Uh, and so, um, so these virtual machines that you see here, these are standard virtual machines running inside of OpenStack. They can run anything that runs on x86-64, including Windows, including Debian, including you know, Linux, uh, CentOS, Red Hat, whatever you want them to run. Right? And the users actually interface with these virtual machines using, the same, using Horizon, which is how they, would, how they would normally interface with virtual machines that are running in OpenStack. So there's nothing different from the user's point of view. The users using your OpenStack cluster would not even know that it was being managed by Bright because it's just OpenStack, right? In addition, Bright provides the ability to use uh, what we call Bright managed instances. So these are instances that are running inside of OpenStack that are using the same software images as you're using locally. So just like with EC2, how I mentioned that you could use the same images on EC2 that you're using locally, you can also use, this, use those same images inside of OpenStack. So that gives you the ability to have a certain set of uh, blessed images that you can use both in your private cloud and in the public cloud. Uh, and so that gives you consistency in regards to you know, the user jobs and what the user's expectations being met and your security you know, uh, being met as well. Uh, finally, Bright adds the ability to deploy what we call Cluster as a Service. So Cluster as a Service is, uh, runs on top of OpenStack, and it allows you to uh, basically assign entire clusters to organizations. So if a certain professor or a certain student needs to do a research project, they need a cluster for a certain period of time, you can easily assign them an entire cluster of resources. They can use those however long they, they need them, and then when they, they're done with them, they go away. Inside those clusters, you can run HPC clusters, Hadoop clusters, or even other OpenStack clusters. Wouldn't be that efficient, but you could do it. Uh, so this is a, a, a brand new um, uh, product that Bright has as well. Uh, so to, to recap just a little bit, Bright gives you the ability to deploy HPC clusters, Hadoop clusters, and OpenStack clusters, including cluster as a service, and you manage it all through a single pane of glass, which is the Bright CM GUI, or for you shell people, the Bright CMSH, which is a shell program that does exactly the same thing, and you can use it to programmatically control the cluster. Um, there's one more thing that I wanted to mention. This is very, very important. Uh, dynamic provisioning of physical nodes, which we call, I call anyway, a bare metal private cloud, right? So this is what it looks like. Okay, so going back to our same picture that we had before, I want you to pay attention to the, the nodes on the right there that are kind of grayed out. Let's just assume those nodes are out of the picture. They're being used by, uh, by OpenStack at this point, okay? Uh, and on the other hand, note that on the, on the first five nodes, node one through five there, I've assigned an operating system to them and, name, and no, uh, names to them as well, right? So that's going to become important. Now, let's assume that you have different user groups, different groups of users that run different applications and that those different applications have different requirements. Standard, pretty standard scenario, right? Now, 
Um, typically, in an HPC data center, all these nodes are provisioned with a certain operating system and version with a certain set of packages. And so what happens when a user submits a job and there's no resources available to run that job, they queue up, right? So you have users waiting to run jobs. And in some cases, you have empty nodes that uh, are, are idle, but they can't run that particular job because they don't have the exact requirements, right? Okay, so let's take a look at that scenario. So here's your three user groups. I'm calling them group A, group B, and group C. And then um, uh, let's say that we have three bright node categories, which are uh, configurations, including disk layouts, workload management settings, um, uh, many different settings that control how a node is configured, right? So. The, node, the definition that's inside a node category, once it's applied to a node, it controls many aspects about that node, what software image is using, for example, right? Uh, okay, and let's finally assume that there are uh, three workload management queues, QA, QB, and QC. So the idea here is that users in group A will submit jobs to QA, and users in group B will submit jobs to QB, and users in QC will, in group C will submit to QC. Again, it's a trivial example, but I think it's gonna make the point for you here. So now let's finally assume that, uh, that node one is serving QA, and node two is serving QB, and node five is serving QC, and node three and four are turned off because there's no workload. So this is different than your typical scenario. Typical scenario, those nodes keep running, using up power day and night, even though there's nothing to run on them. And people will say, well, my nodes are always busy. But are they really always busy? Well, to the extent that they have to manually power them on and off, yeah, they are. But in this case, it's an automated thing. Let's say they're turned off, right? Because there's no jobs to run on them. So what happens? Uh, I see I've got a yellow panel over there. Okay, let's say that somebody from group C now comes in and submits some jobs to QC. What happens? Well, Bright can be configured to automatically assign the node category for node category C to nodes three and four and power them on. When they come up, they get imaged with the software image that's assigned to node category C, the disk layouts associated with that node category, the workload management is associated with, and everything else about it, right? So we can dynamically change the characteristics of nodes in your data center based on the workload that's coming in, and when there's no workload coming in, we can turn them off. And when there's more workload coming in than you have resources, we can burst out to Amazon EC2. That's a dynamic data center. So that's what we have to offer. Now, I wanted to say one final thing, and that is this. Oh yeah, so when there's no more workload, Bright turns them off, right? Okay, so that's the final conclusion there. Um, I think I've already said this already, so I wanna say one more thing, and that is that this is something that I personally am seeing in industry every day and more and more, right? Industry needs to be able to use their resources in the most efficient way possible, okay? So they need this dynamic aspect to it. They need to be able to power off nodes that aren't in use. They need to be able to convert nodes to different setups automatically when different workload comes in and they need to be able to expand automatically into the cloud and they need to be able to, to do all these things in a cluster, right? So uh, to the extent that you have students or you are a student, this is something you need to know about, right? Uh, so this is something that I think is very important for educational institutions to teach the students because when they go out into, into industry, they're gonna find out that the uh, situation has changed. It's always changing, it continues. Thank you so much.